So we've we've gone two different ways with this. Kind of, you know, the process of scouting versus showing up blind and turning and burning and just and getting into new spots. And people are probably listening to this going, well, what should I do? This guy's <laughs> how, schizophrenic. <laughs> well, how do I kill a big buck? And here's the right. thing about it. I, I was thinking about this actually today. I, I was I was at the gym and I'm just like kind of zoned out. And I was thinking like, you know, you really, you you need to be able to do, if you, if you want to become a really good whitetail hunter, I, in in a variety of situations, you can you can be a really good whitetail hunter on a on a specific property, which mm-hmm. is what a lot of people have done to be successful in this industry. But if you want to be the guy who can show up in PA and drive to Michigan and drive to wherever and do this, you have to have a lot of tools in your arsenal. So I'm always like. I'm not knocking anybody, but when I hear somebody who's got like their thing, like this is how I do this, you know, I'm always like, really, like you, you always hunt no matter where you go. There's like, this is your process and you find this, you find this bed and you backtrack it or something like that. I'm like, always, you know, to me, it's like, that's like a a different language because, you know, you might show up, you, you might have a place an hour from your house that you can scout all year round and learn and have those, you know, (laughs) spot A, B, C, D, or, you know, two properties down the road that you can show up in and have this, have a better knowledge than the blind spot, right. That you just showed up to. But if you go show up at those blind spots, you learn a lot about hunting that way too. And the the more stuff you do, it's just like, you know, I, I know you're a saddle guy, like, having a satellite at your disposal and having the the know how to use some, you know, hang on tree stands and sticks and understanding when to sit on the ground, build a natural ground, ground blind or however you have to do it. The more stuff you have like that, the, the, the list of places that you can't hunt gets a lot smaller and that's important. Right now, a hundred percent. I'm glad you brought that up. Cause that for me, like that epiphany at, at one point was, was the thing that I think really changed my perspective on how I, how I approach hunting. Cause the way I grew up was very much, you know, the hunting culture you would expect from Pennsylvania where it's like you hunt your back 40, you hunt the same two or three, you know, stands or locations. I mean, I grew up ground hunting. I was never in an elevated platform or setup until I was in my thirties, you know, so I never even knew what that was like, you know? And so, you know, I think you're right where it's like, I, you know, you have to adapt and these are really just tools in your, in your tool belt to, to pull out when you need them at different, at different moments. And so there is no one size fits all, which is why, you know, someone who has a specific distinct process and they've hunted their back 40 all their life, they're going to probably struggle if they go somewhere, somewhere new, right? The guy who maybe jumps around can probably jump into a piece that he has no knowledge of and can, can kind of figure it, can kind of figure it out. You know, for example, you know, I'll be going back to Ohio this year. There's a big chunk of public there that, you know, two years ago, it pretty much kicked my ass. It's low deer density, but there's monsters there. And we had monsters on camera and I, I knew they were there and I just could not find one to save my life. Um, so I'm bound to determine to go. It's one of those places when I finally do kill one where I will, I'll never go back yeah. <laughs> after, after that. Um, but it's just, we, you know, I've hunted it one year and my one buddy has hunted it multiple years and he's, you know, they've, um, had encounters. Well, he had an encounter with one that was between 180 and 200 inches this year, just depending like camera angle. You could tell he was over 180, but just not sure how much over 180. Um, so he's run cameras on that piece for, Good Lord, man, probably six or seven years to where it's like he actually knows like when a ridge will turn on for for the rut where like, you know, these doe families are living here and like this ridge will turn on on the on the third. This ridge turns on on the sixth. You know what I mean? And knows where like all the primary scrape locations are. But the place is like 70,000 acres. And so or like, yeah, I think it's 70,000 acres. So it's it's one of those places where it's, it's a big wood setting. So even when you do find that hot sign or that, you know, that there's a primary scrape location, it's like are you really willing to sit it for seven days straight? You know what I mean? To wait for that deer to come by, you know, that's the, that's the game that you're playing in that, in that scenario. So even though we know about it, it's still one of those things where we have to use that kind of mobile approach to kind of, to try to, you know, to try to get it done. And then just to cover off one last thing, it's like, for me, it's like, I'm always trying to add like a new tool every year. Like I'm always trying to implement something new. And so for me this year, Um, it's, it's, for me, it's about, you know, implementing a ground and pound approach. I had a couple setups in Iowa where if I was just a more proficient ground hunter, I probably would have had a really good opportunity. I I bumped a, a a booner out of a draw in a, in a CRP field and there was just no trees to get into. I went back, I saw where he was bedded, I hunted his bed the next day from the ground. I had a small, I rattled a small buck in, but he never showed up. But it was in that moment that I realized I was like, man, there was a lot of opportunity in that area that I was at to hunt 
from the ground because there was nobody in these like CRP areas that were just completely wide open. And I was just like, I know there's bucks in there. Like yep. I know there, I jumped one, you know? Yep. So, and so that really for me is like my charge this year is to add that tool to my tool belt is to be able to, when I find a ground setup that I'm confident enough to, to make it happen. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so situational, but that, you know, we all know deer love CRP bucks, mm-hmm. big bucks love CRP. Any, any pheasant hunter out there knows it. But hunting them in it is a different story. You know, and we, we yeah. see the YouTube videos every year, people who spot the big rack sticking out and they crawl in and they shoot them. But to, to develop an ambush approach around something like that is That's tough. It's difficult, man. It, it just yeah. is. But those deer are there for a reason. Like they, they, not only is it just good cover for deer, but they're there because like you said, the hunting pressure is not really there and they, yeah. they you know, they have so many advantages to that, but that, that kind of thing, I, I, I kind of want to back up cause you, you mentioned, you know, showing up, I mean, we, we've talked about this a lot showing up and hunting and, you know, maybe it's, it's different than the culture in, in PA where you grew up, where everybody had their places to go and they had their stands and they knew they were going to sit, you know, kind of like the traditional rifle hunting culture where it's like okay that's my stand i sit it whether the wind's blowing this way or that way or whatever (laughs) you know rain shine every day of the season till we do our drives or whatever but and so it i I don't want anyone to hear this and think well if you've if you've grown up that way you can't just go up and uh, go somewhere else and shoot a deer you you'd find if you just understand the basics of what deer do kind of where do they eat where do they like to travel what do they like to drink like those kind of things they don't really change from coos deer to northern whitetails. Like there's there's par- so many parallels, and the sign thing is huge. You've mentioned scrapes yeah. a bunch of times already, and what I think people would find is a lot of times we we've kind of been led to believe, okay, I've, I'm going to have my spot, and I'm going to run my cameras there, and I'm going to have a food plot, I'm going to have this badass box blind or this stand, and that's my spot. And eventually the bucks are going to come, and it, you, you kind of get in that lane, and it, you might think, well, I can't just go show up in South Dakota or northern Missouri and go kill a buck. And what you'd find is you've probably been locked into hunting a certain way and not realizing that you're capable of doing a lot more out there and, and experiencing a different kind of hunt. And you'd probably find that you freaking love it. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I, I think you're, I think people do get locked in, like you said, and it's like, and they, they think it's out, you know, outside of their reach. I think Western hunting is a good example of that there's so many people that think that hunting out West is just so far outside of their reach. And it's not, if you really plan for it, prioritize it and, you know, and, and do a DIY. If you're comfortable doing a DIY hunt, it's like, I had someone just ask me this the other day and I was like, you can do it for, you can do it pretty on the cheap. It just depends on how comfortable you want to be. You know what I mean? That's really what's going to determine how cheap it is, you know, cause you can go, you know, I did a Montana elk hunt and it was reasonable, you know, it was reasonable. It was all on public land where we, you know, stayed in a wall tent and, and hunted public land. So it was no more expensive than it would have been for me to travel a couple of States over and hunt whitetails, to be honest, you know? Um, you know, I, so I think that people often do think it's out of reach. I think the one thing too, is that, you know, people listen to a podcast like this and it's like, you and I are dear nuts and dear nerds, right? So it's like, we get all into the details and tweak every last thing. But I think a lot of times we make it, you know, make it more difficult than it needs to be, you know, <laughs> like for, for example, I think the, I think what you just said was like, perfect. It's like, you know, if you understand the basics, if you understand like, you know, don't fully give the deer the wind, like hunt the right wind, don't hunt the completely wrong wind, right? Right know what food sources are, are trending that time of year, right? Know what their biology is telling, is telling them to do. Right. And if you just know those handful of things like you can put yourself in position to, to see deer, understand their edge creatures and just hunt edges. Like if you just did that alone on properties, like you would, you would run into deer. I think the other misnomer too, is, is the whole idea of how much pressure a whitetail will, will withstand or can withstand. I think we give them way too little credit for as much nerve as they have, because I think people feel like if you bump a deer, like, so my approach a lot of times too, you know, especially whenever I'm doing these out of state freelance hunts where it's like, I don't know anything about a spot. If I'm struggling, like I will literally go to places where I think there are deer and I will purposefully bump deer because part of the best Intel I can get is to know there's a deer in a spot, right? If there's one deer in a spot, chances are it's probably good for another deer. Right. And so it's not that it's not my first choice, but I don't view on those type of hunts, particularly 
that it's a bad deal because they're going to likely be back. If it's a bed that I jumped them out of that just proved the point that that bed works. Right. And so that's a safe spot that they can escape danger. So it's likely that they're going to use it again. Maybe not that night, maybe not the next day, but like in the next day or two, they're, they're, they're likely going to come back. And so I've kind of taken that approach and, and just been a little, less careful. I think you also have to take into consideration like how big is the piece that you're on. You know, I'm not going to do that if I'm hunting on a 60 acre piece or whatever, you know, maybe even a hundred acre piece. But if I get to like five, six, 700 acres, like I'm willing to take that risk. Right. Cause I just, I want to find where they're at yeah. and then I can start to make a plan, you know? And so many people are like, Oh my God, you bumped that deer. You'll never see him again. I'm like, it's just not true. I, I kicked the deer out of the bed in Iowa, set up, had two deer come in, knew it was the right spot left all my stuff in the tree, waited till like 11 o'clock the next day and knew it was my last hunt. And I had scouted that day before knowing that I kind of wanted to end up in a general area, got back into that same tree because I knew that that was where I'd likely want to be. And then that buck walked through at three 30. So it was just like, and I walked all through their bedroom, you know what I mean? And so there's a difference between passing through and putting your feed on their couch. <laughs> you know what I mean? So big time, man. I, you, you, such a good point there. We, we've been led to believe there, there's neurotic lunatics that as soon as they catch wind of us or they see us, they're just gonzo and, and it's over. And part of that has come from, you know, kind of the, the land manager deer growing part of our our outdoor media crowd who will yeah. say, well, this is the bedding area. I never go in there. And it's right. like, well, that's, that's awesome for you, but we're hunting public land where people go all the time. And the, the more you spent time you spent out there, you know, Bo and I got into this, the more you just jump deer and realize like, it's not the end of the world. Like you're just, that's something that's just going to happen. I mean, I'll never forget, uh, probably, I don't know, I think it was 2015, 2016. I can't remember. I went out to South Dakota for their opener, um, and I had I had a had a guy with me, and he went off and hunted a spot I had found, and it was it was hot, so it was kind of a water deal, you know. We're gonna sit on cattle mm-hmm. ponds or whatever, and there were some acorns around them, and you know, we just kind of that was kind of the plan. It was the end of September, and every place I wanted to go, the wind was wrong or somebody was parked there, and I had found this pond right by a parking area, like 150 yards away, you know, one of those <laughs> deals, and I was like, yeah, there's no way somebody's not gonna go through there today. Just, it just, right. you, you just know, but I ran out of options. And so I, I drove by it. I looked, there was nobody parked in there. I drove down there, grabbed my stand sticks, ran down there. And I knew there was, there was these three little scrub oaks on the edge of this pond that I could get up into for that wind. I get down there and I walk up to the tree that I'm going to set up in and this buck gets up and runs away from underneath, bedded underneath the tree in the shade. You know, I'm like, son of a bitch, like that, right. that, that sucks. <laughs> Go start, get, get my sticks in quick, you know, and it, I could only get up like 12, 13 feet. Cause it was small tree. I didn't, I didn't need to get up that high anyway. And I got the platform up, stepped on it. I looked over and here comes this buck running over the hill and stops 15 yards away. And my bow's on the ground, <laughs> you know, my release isn't yep. on nothing. And I had <laughs> just jumped a buck that ran that way over there. And this buck, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm like, how am I going to do this? Cause I had my rope tied to my stand. So I'm like, I can get my bow up, but he's 15 yards away. And right. he, there was all these flies. Cause it was the first part of the season, you know, it was hot. And every time he'd shake his head, I'd pull it up just a little bit more. And he went down and started drinking. I pulled it up. I knocked an arrow and shot him. And I was like, right. you, you know, like if you, a lot, I think a lot of people would have walked in there, jumped that buck and written that off. And it right. didn't even matter at all. You know, it just, it mattered to that one buck I jumped, but that wasn't the same buck that came over. I mean, it's just, you see stuff like that, the more times you spend out there and the less... I think the less worked up you get about stuff like that and the more you just kind of like, that's just part of the game. I'm going to let that go. The the better the decision-making process will be for you and the easier the success will come. Right now, I 100% agree with you. I think the biggest thing, you know, especially if it's someone that's listening out there that's, you know, is hunting public land or wants to add that to their repertoire, like the biggest asset I think that you can have is being a, being a problem solver, right? And, and not necessarily... Um, dwelling on the challenges that you're going to going to encounter because if if you dwell on those challenges and those barriers it's going to be really really difficult to find success on on public land because you're going to have a lot of them and i think sometimes you got to think a little outside the box too you know what i mean like you got to kind of think about 
what are other guys or girls likely to do? You know what I mean? And so it's, you know, it's the classic zig when other people zag. It's that close to the parking lot kind of spot. The, the, the place that I, it was the, my first trip to, I think it was my first trip to this spot in Ohio. And I went out in the summer and did a little pre-scouting and I ended up, the truth of the matter was I ended up getting into this piece of timber and got lost. My GPS quit. I'd never been to this area. I walked around. I couldn't figure out how to get back to my truck, got turned around. It was super thick. Everything looked the same. And then I hiked to the top of this ridge and I was like, I knew where there was a river that I came in near. And I was like, well, it was nice and sunny too. So I was like, maybe I can get to a high spot where I can at least see glare off the water. And if I can see that, I'll at least know which direction the river is. Well, sure enough, I found it. I saw the glare. And so I knew which direction the river was. And then all of a sudden I was like, wait, I just walked a huge circle for like three hours, essentially. I was like, and I'm literally probably only like three tenths of a mile from my truck at this point. Right. <laughs> three days later, I ended up hunting that same spot. Now it's like, it's a nasty climb up like a pretty steep, you know, piece of it, it's, you know, uh, basically a, a river Ridge essentially through a bunch of multi-floor rows and blow down. Right. But it was so close to an oil pump that was there and so close to the road that nobody was, everyone was overlooking it. And whenever I walked out that night, that first night after I got lost and finally got into a tree, when I walked down out, I scouted my way out and there were just hammer rubs and sign everywhere. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. I was like, I'm going to hunt this again. I ended up coming back and it was the third day of the hunt. And I ended up, you know, killing a Pope and young deer at like one o'clock in the afternoon. You know, I ended up grunting him in and I, I, I actually did a, a blind grunt. He jumped up and between, between the time I grunted it and stuck an arrow in him was probably all of like 30 seconds. And he was just bedded on the other side of this like drainage that I couldn't see through the brush. And it's one of those things where it's like, you know, if you're, if you're one of these guys, I'm going to go three miles deep because that's what you got to do to kill big bucks. It's like, I would have totally overlooked that spot. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I was thinking about, and I was looking at where people were parking as I was driving in and stuff like that. So I was like, okay, not there, not there, not there. And then I got in there and got lost kind of happy, happy accident. And then found this spot and then just listened to the sign. And it was an extremely overlooked spot. So fast forward, I told a buddy of mine about it. He goes back the next year, didn't kill, but he saw like a, a mid one forties, you know, eight point running around in there. I hunted it the year after that. And I had a mid one forties, eight point on camera that I played cat and mouse in that general area with for like a handful of days. And he went back last year and saw another one about the same, about the same caliber. And it's just one of those hot little spots, man, that, you know, that it's, I ended up scouting it a little bit more and figured out that it, I was in a saddle and it was a saddle between two doe bedding areas. And they both kind of turn on and come into estrus about the same time every year. And so it's just like they run that saddle back and forth mm -hmm. between those two doe bedding areas. And so you get great morning activity and then you get great afternoon activity and then it kind of dies in, in the evening or yeah. whatever. So it's just, but it's just one of those things. I would have totally never thought to go there if I hadn't kind of stumbled upon it. And it's just, you know, stuff off of parking lots and along roads. It's like, just don't be too proud to, <laughs> to hop into it. Man, I'll take an easy hunt all day if I can get one, you know.